This guy proved one of the most mind-blowing theorems of all of mathematics. He showed that in mathematics, there will always be unanswerable questions. And by that, I don't mean questions that haven't been answered yet, or haven't been answered by then. I mean questions that just have no answers at all. These are questions that are unanswerable. This is a consequence of his famous first incompleteness theorem. This theorem says that from any reasonable list of axioms from mathematics, there is always a statement that is true, but cannot be proved. This will be a statement that, despite being true, we won't be able to be certain about it. We won't be able to produce a proof for it. And in mathematics, the only way to be certain about something is by proving it. This theorem is not about a limitation on our human capacity to produce proofs. It's a limitation on the actual existence of proofs. This in this video, what I want to do is give you an introduction to what Gödel incompleteness theorem says, mathematically. I won't give you all the details, but I will give you the general idea. We need to start by understanding what some of these words actually mean. In particular, very importantly, is to understand what it means to be provable. If we want to prove that something is not provable, we need to have a formal definition of what it means for something to be provable. Okay, what is a proof? Here is a definition. A proof is an argument that uses logical steps to show that a mathematical statement follows from certain assumptions. Let's get deeper into what this actually means. There are a few things here that are important. First, what we're talking about proving here are concrete mathematical statements. We're not talking about proving an ambiguous statement about the weather. We are talking about concrete mathematical statements. So we need to be explicit about what we mean by a concrete mathematical statement. And for that, we need to define a formal language. A proof is made out of logical steps. We all know in practice, when writing a proof, we can use any reasoning we like, so long as everybody agrees that the steps we are taking are logical. But if we want to talk about proofs as concrete objects, to be able to prove things about them, we need to be explicit about which logical steps we are allowed to use. These logical steps are called rules. Third, we need assumptions. When you write a proof, you always use previous knowledge. That previous knowledge usually comes in forms of theorems that were proved before. And those theorems use previous knowledge. And if you keep on going backwards, mm -hmm. you will eventually reach statements that are so basic that you just cannot prove. But they are basic enough that you don't need to prove them. Those are the axioms. More than 100 years ago, this man wanted to build a formal system for all of mathematics where all statements could be proved in a purely formal and syntactical way. By that I mean in a way that only involves manipulating symbols, following certain rules in a purely mechanical way, without having to even know what the symbols mean. This way you could be sure about something being true or not, in a purely mechanical way, uh, that nobody could argue with. Let's see how that worked out at the end. So let's see what a formal system is. It consists of three things. A language, a set of rules, and a list of axioms. Language. To define a language, we need symbols. They are like the letters of the alphabet. And grammatical rules that tell us how to put these symbols together. Here is a standard list of symbols. The first symbols, 0, 1, plus, times, belongs to, form what is called a vocabulary. And those are variable. You can change them for some other symbols if you want to work with something else. These ones are good enough. The latter ones, equality and or not, exist for all. The variable symbols and the parentheses are called the logical symbols. And they are essentially fixed in all first order logic. You can modify them slightly. For instance, here I didn't add the implication symbol because you can just define it from the other. So you may add it or not. But essentially, these are the logical symbols. OK, then we need to put the symbols together. And for that, we need grammatical rules. Here's a standard set of rules, but don't worry about the details. I don't want to get into them right now. I just want you to see what they look like. Essentially, when you see a string of symbols, you're going to be able to tell if it makes sense or doesn't. For instance, this one here obviously doesn't make sense, while this other one, for every x there exists a y, such as y plus y equals x, or y plus y equals x plus 1, is a sequence of symbols that makes sense. All right, let's go into the rules. These are the rules of logical thinking, the rules that we use when we write proofs. For example, there is a rule that says that if you can prove not phi, that is, the negation of phi, where phi is a grammatically correct sequence of symbols, and you can prove phi or psi, then you can prove psi. For instance, if phi was the sentence x equals y and psi was the sentence z equals 1, then this rule will read as follows. We express such rules in the following format. If you can prove the statements on the top, you can prove the statements on the bottom. Here is an example of a full set of rules of first order logic. Again, don't worry about the details. I just wanted to show you what they look like. 
axioms. These are the statements that describe the very basic behavior of whatever you're working with. Numbers, sets, groups, rings, whatever you're working with. The axioms don't need to be proved. They are used as basic assumptions within our proofs. If you're going to use them in our proof, they better be true. So they better be obviously true. And hopefully we have enough axioms to derive everything we want. As we'll see, this is too much to hope for. Here's an example of a list of axioms. These are the piano axioms. They are the standard axioms to work with when you're working with the natural numbers. They start with the very basic properties of zero, one, plus, and times. And then we have the axioms for induction, which allow you to do proofs by induction. There is another list of axioms that is used to axiomatize all of mathematics. It's called the sermero frankel set theory. Okay, so now we know what a formal system is. Here come the key points. The language is complete. So all mathematical statements can be expressed in this language. Once you get used to working in this language, you're gonna see that every mathematical statement you wanna make, you can make it in this formal language using these grammatical rules. So that's good. All right, then the rules, they're also complete. Okay, this is not a simple observation like the previous ones. There is no reason to believe at first that these few rules are gonna be enough to formalize all arguments mathematicians want to make. Arguments come in all shapes of forms, but surprisingly, they are enough. This is another of Gettle's famous theorems. It's called the completeness theorem. And it says that if you can prove something, you can prove it using only these rules. It actually says that if a statement is true in all possible universes, then it can be proved using these rules. Okay, there are some subtleties here that I'm leaving for another time. The axioms, though, are not complete. And this is what the incompleteness theorem says. Gödel proved both the completeness and the incompleteness theorems. It's not that like he couldn't make up his mind about completeness or incompleteness. It's just that completeness was about the rules and incompleteness was about the axioms. The incompleteness theorem wouldn't be so important without the completeness theorem next to it. This is because the incompleteness theorem tells us that something cannot be proved. And for that, we need to understand what it means for something to be proved in a formal way. And that's where the rules come in. So the incompleteness theorems is the one that tells us that the rules actually capture the notion of probability. There is one more thing we need to explain. What do we mean by a reasonable list of axioms? We mean a list that satisfies three things, that the axioms are true, that we can recognize them when we see them. Formally, this says that we can write a computer program that if we input a statement, it's gonna tell us if it's an axiom or not. If the list of axioms is finite, this is trivial. If you have a list, you just check that it's in the list. But the condition is important when we have an infinite list of axioms, which, believe it or not, that's actually often the case. And three, we need the axioms to have a minimal functionality. They need to be sufficiently strong to do some basic arithmetic. The incompleteness theorem says that no list of axioms satisfying these properties is going to be complete. There is always going to be something missing. If you have a list of axioms and then later we find some other statement that we believe is true and we cannot prove, well, we're going to say, well, let's add it to the list of axioms. Okay, we added the list of axioms. But the theorem still holds, so that means there's going to be some other statement that is going to be true, but still not provable. And if we add it, there's going to be another one. There is no way around this. We will always meet some statement. There are a million subtleties that need to be addressed here. I'll get into one of them. The word true here doesn't have a very clear meaning when we're dealing with strange formal systems. Godel's original statement wasn't exactly this one up here. It didn't deal with the notion of truth for complicated statements. It only dealt with the notion of truth for very simple statements about the natural numbers, where there is no discussion about what truth means. A few years later, Rosser proved a version of Gödel's theorem that doesn't involve the word truth at all. It just deals with manipulations of sentences, axioms, rules, etc. Purely combinatorial. It only gets more interesting from here. 